Come on, sometimes we need to learn to just get a praise in our mouth for how good God is. Sometimes we got to learn to wake ourselves up and to wake our minds up to how faithful he's been to you. Don't forget how good he's been to you. Don't forget how faithful he's been in your life. And some of us just need to learn to praise God in the middle of your storm and tell God you trust him, even though it doesn't look like it's working out. God, I trust you. God, I believe in you. God, my faith is in you. Come on, I wish we had a few people in this room who would just praise God in this place. Lift up a shout, lift up a shout of praise. He's worthy of your shout. He's worthy of your worship this morning. Oh, come on, we gotta wake up in this place. Give him glory. He's worthy. You know, you know, praise, we think some of it, I used to think that praise and singing was a little soft. I didn't realize praise was my weapon. Praise is a sword I use to cut Goliath's head off. Praise is what I use to get myself and make sure I get on over to the other side. When I praise God, when I lift a shout of praise, I'm telling the devil, I don't care what you throw at me. I know my God is in control. I trust him. I believe in him. And what he said about me will come to pass. I wish I had a few people in here that could give God some praise in this place. Come on and give him glory. Give him praise that he deserves. He deserves all the praise. I think we're ready. So when you have an attitude of praise, there is no force, there's no weapon that can come against you, that can shut you up. And maybe you're in here and you're saying, man, why is everybody so loud? Because they got something to praise God about, that's why. And listen, Maybe it's been hard for you to utter out a praise or a shout because you don't feel like it. I understand. I know how it feels. I know how it feels to be in a hopeless situation, to have no hope for your family. You have no hope for your health. You have no hope for your situation. And you have no reason to shout a praise. Well, I got a reason. I got a good reason. And it's this. Jesus has defeated every enemy you will ever face. He conquered it on the cross. Every devil, every lying demon, every sickness, every disease, every obstacle, every warfare, all depression, all suicidal thoughts, everything you've ever faced. Jesus purchased your freedom on the cross and defeated the devil once and for all. That's something to praise God about. The battle is fixed. The fight has been won. You got nothing to worry about. When you got Jesus on your side, you have the victory. Somebody give Jesus a shout of praise if you know you got the victory. Yes. All right. We got to preach the word. Thank you, Brene. This is Brene telling me it's time to preach. Okay, I got you. Thank you. Let's give a hand to our media team and our worship team and our, all our amazing teams. Who's ready to jump in the word today? I'm going to read this verse and I'll let you sit down. Hang on, hang on. Everyone's like, ooh, uh, ooh, hang on. James chapter 2, verse 21 through 24. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God 
and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. God, in this moment, as we dive into your precious word, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to speak so clearly to all of us today. It's no accident we're in this room, God. You have a word for us today. So use me, speak through me. I depend all on your power and your word. Have your way today. In Jesus' name we pray. And we say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Give your neighbor a high five. Tell them, I'm so glad to see you in church today. <clears throat> and hello, everybody online right now. Welcome to service online. Can we give our online viewers a big wave, a big hello? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see you today. There are two very significant moments in a believer's life. These moments happen distinctly from one another, almost never at the same time. Number one, the moment you believe, and number two, the moment you prove it. I meet a lot of people that say, I believe in God. Oh yeah, I grew up in church, I believe in God, my, my uh, grandma, prays for me all the time. I pray all the time. I believe in God. But they don't live like it. They live a totally different way than what they believe. But on the other side of the spectrum, there are people who depend on just what they do to be considered right before God. But they don't believe in the power of God's word. I, I've even seen, this just sounds so crazy, I've seen, we're at a point nowadays in our world where there are churches manipulating scripture to fit their own lifestyle. As long as I'm a good person, God will love me. I've even heard of pastors, big pastors, I won't say who, but big pastors that have said, maybe we should stop reading scriptures in church. So there are people that say, I believe in the word, I believe in God, but I don't do it. And there are other people that say, I don't really believe in all of that, but I live right. But neither of those two alone work. You need faith and you need actions. You need to talk about it and you need to live it out. You need both. Someone say you need both. You can't have one without the other. Just to recap on some of the verses we read previously in, in James. There's a portion where James says, oh, you believe in God? Good for you. Even demons believe. And they tremble. It doesn't mean that demons live it out. Their belief is correct, but their behavior is not. I've never seen a demon believe so much that the demons start repenting. Demon at the altar with his little demon hands just, God forgive me for being a demon. No demon lives right. But at least that demon trembles before God because of how deeply they believe in God and know who God is. My question to you is, could it be that a demon has more faith than you. At least the demon trembles where they tremble, they fear, they reverence the name of God. They're afraid of the name of Jesus because they know the power of his name. And yet we, we say we believe, but we don't bat an eye when we go back to our sin. Could it be that a demon believes in God more than we do? 
If that's the case, we're no different when we just say it, but we don't live it out. Just talking the talk doesn't prove you got it. Just saying it doesn't prove you got what it takes. I love, I love watching these big fights where you got these guys, they just, they, they could talk. They got the biggest mouths. They just, I'm like, I cannot wait for this guy to get knocked out in the first round. I'm just, he's going to get humbled. I, I'm, I'm a big Laker fan. Any Laker fans in here? <laughs> Hallelujah. Any Clipper fans? Don't raise your hand. Uh-oh. I saw you. I'm a Laker fan, and, th and th during this playoffs, they, they face the Grizzlies. And uh, <laughs> see, hear someone laugh. They know where I'm going. And they face the Grizzlies, and they had this young guy. He's a young guy, third or fourth year, something like that in the league. And he started to get a little name for himself, you know. So he's matched up with LeBron James. LeBron James, he's matched up with LeBron. So he has actually a good game. Seems like he's locking down LeBron. He's contesting LeBron's shots. He's getting some buckets. So he goes to the post-game interview. He's got his shades on, his necklace. They're interviewing him. How'd you do it? What are you thinking? He makes his voice a little bit deeper. He's like, you know, <laughs> I ain't scared of nobody. I poke bears. That's what I do. I don't give no respect to no one until they come give me 40. That's <laughs> what he says. The media had a field day with this. Dylan Brooks, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. I, I pray for you and pray that God loves you. And Come visit us at the way. <laughs> the next game, you know what happens. This guy gets humbled so badly, and I mean so badly, he cancels every post-game interview. He doesn't see a camera or a microphone for months. He hides in a cave, and everyone's like, what happened to Dylan Brooks? Where'd he go? He was humbled so badly because he was all talk but no show. How many of us are living kind of like that in the spirit? We are all talking church. We shout the pastor down, hallelujah, preach it, brother. When we go home, we can't even keep a, a, a peaceful environment in our home because we argue so much. How many of us, are? we come to church, we do our due diligence, and we check in our kids, and we love, we get them all cleaned up, but we go home, and we can't even for a moment speak godly words out of our mouth, and nothing but curse words come out. How many of us are all talk but no show? We're no different. We've all been in the same boat. But I believe that God is raising up a church of people that are saying, I am going to be finished with just talking. And I am going from just being a talker to walking it out. I'm not just going to talk about it, but I'm going to live it out. I'm going to be about it. The title of the message today is Be About It. Someone say, Be About It. Tell your neighbor, Be About It. We're going to take this verse by verse. I'm telling you, James does not play. If you need a, a heart check, a life check, read the book of James. If you just feel like fighting, read James. James 2, 21, it says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right? If you got your Bible on you, underline that word shown, or you got your Bible app, click it. And then click yellow or green or however you're going to highlight it. Was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Number one point of the day is this. Your actions will snitch you out. And for those of you that have 0% hood in you, the word snitch means tattletale. Your actions will tattletale on you. Your actions will snitch you out. Your actions tell on you. Your actions say what's actually on the inside. And Abraham was shown to be right 
because his actions backed up what he believed. The word shown means justified or to be made righteous. In other words, his works didn't just, his works didn't make him right, but Abraham proved what was on the inside by doing it, by living what he believed. He demonstrated it. He was about it. And in this life, you're going to face tests in life that either demonstrate if you have the faith you say you do or if your faith is dead. It says in Genesis, this is the story that James is referring to when he talks about Abraham. He's referring to the story of when Abraham was commanded by God to give his son, his only son, as a sacrifice to God. Look at Genesis chapter 22, verse, starting at verse 1 through 2. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. You know, it's funny. Some of us think that God doesn't test us. We have this idea that God won't test you, brother. He just wants you to be happy and chill all the time. Well, that's wrong. God will test you. God won't tempt you, but he will test you. God won't tempt you into sin, but he will test to see if your faith is what you say it is. So he tests Abraham's faith. He says, Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Say it with me. Say, yes, here I am. God tells him, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. What a big call. What a big test. Abraham right now in this moment is being tested if he believes and trusts God. Just like we said, I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail. God says, if you trust me, then give me what you're holding on to. If you trust me, let go of the thing that's holding you back. If you trust me, surrender your sin to me and let me give you something new. Trust me. Goes on in verse 10, skips over. So Abraham gets his son, he gets his servants immediately early the next day. He goes up the hill with his son, ready to sacrifice his son. And we come to verse 10. It says, and Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, here I am. Say that with me. Say yes, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For, no, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son your only son. Abraham proved that he really believed what he said he believed. The only way to truly show and to prove that you believe in the God of the impossible is by trusting him in your actions. That's the only way. Otherwise, it's all talk. Otherwise, it's all Dylan Brooks. Sorry, Dylan. Sorry, Dylan Brooks. That's the only way we can show God that we believe in him is if we walk it out. Do you believe me? Yeah. Then do it. Uh. Oh, so you don't believe me. No, I do, God. I believe in you. I wear a cross and everything. I'm, if you wear a cross, I'm not saying it's bad. I, wear, I, I, I don't have a cross on, but that's okay. You can wear a cross. But are you living like it? That's the question. And that's the real question that we're dealing with here in this passage of Scripture. Is we're dealing with people who are all talk but no show. We're dealing with people that are haughty in their own behavior. And they think they're better than everybody else because of how good they live. And how perfect their attendance in church has been. But when they go home, they don't live it out. And God is looking for a pure generation of integrity and character. And it doesn't matter if you're perfect or not. He's just looking for somebody that can apply his word. And listen to his instruction. And walk it out. Do I have anybody? 
anybody in here who is saying, God, I want to walk it out. I want to be about it. Someone say, be about it. So he does it. He gives it up. So point one is your actions will what? They'll snitch you out. Point number two, your faith and actions should work as a team, not as enemies. Look at verse 22. It says, you see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. See, when your actions are working alongside your faith, they begin to back each other up. This is what it looks like. We say we believe. We believe in our heart that God is good. We say, God, I'm going to trust you in that testing situation. The time where I'm feeling tested. The time where I'm feeling like I want to get ghetto on somebody. The time I'm feeling like I want to blow up. The time I feel like I want to go back to the bottle. The time I want to give up on my family or my relationships. In those moments, God, I'm going to trust you. And the way we complete, the way we help our faith, and the way we partner with our faith is by bringing it in with our actions. Your works and your faith got to work together as a team. They must be co-laborers. They must be partners in crime or in good. They must be work. They must assist one another. They got to work together. And if your works look different than your actions, then you're working against your faith. And anybody that works against their faith is living life totally empty, miserable, and unfulfilled. Some of the most miserable people inside with the lowest sense of self-esteem and courage in this world are people that say they're going to do it and never do it. And you wonder why you have these, these thoughts towards yourself and you feel like you can't amount and you feel like you're not good enough and you feel like you're inadequate. It's because we sometimes we say these things and we don't follow through. But God is so gracious and God is so good and God is so loving that even though we may fall seven times, he says, get right back up. I got you. My power, my grace is sufficient for you. My power works greatest in your weakness. I know it's hard, but I got power for you, son. I got power for you, daughter. If you need my help, I got you. I'm going to back you up. I'm going to work alongside with you. But trust me in this, if you live out my instructions, you will see the blessings open up in your life. Trust me, I got your back. It's one thing to say you're something. It's another thing to prove it in the battlefield. Your actions should be defending your faith, not betraying your faith. Your actions should step in as a partner with your faith, not someone that's working against what you believe. See, when your actions are working against your faith, you're actually planning for destruction. Look at Matthew 7, verse 26. It says, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is what? Foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. Jesus is saying, that's dumb. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. You know what the word foolish means? It means showing no reverence or respect for God. To be a fool means you have no reverence for what God says. You don't care. I could, I could say I live for God and go home and sin, not even bat an eye and not even feel convicted. I can be in places I'm not supposed to be, have zero reverence, no fear of the Lord, no trembling for God. It doesn't matter for me. I, got, I, I have zero reverence for God. This is what Jesus describes as a fool. Someone who hears my word but doesn't do it. You know what happens to the, someone that hears and doesn't do? They're planning for their house to come down. They're planning for destruction. But only those, the only people that graduate in life is when you finally say, I'm done just talking about it. I'm actually going to live this out. 
Those that graduate in life are, the, are people that are battle tested. Someone say battle tested. You take that step from just believing into actually living. And everything you hear here, you hear right here at church, you finally say, I'm done just hearing about it. I'm actually going to live this thing out for good in my life. I, I shared this story not too long ago about me. I, I caught my sister reading her Bible when we were teens. And this was weird because we always went to church, but we kept church at church and we did everything else at home and at school. And then we just kind of lived, all of us, we lived the way we wanted to live. And one day I, I, I went up to her room and she's reading her Bible. And I was just like, oh, whoa, what just happened? And I remember one day talking to her and she said, yeah, because uh, we were just talking. And she's like, yeah, you know, because um, like, you, know you know I'm taking this serious now, right? And I was like, oh, oh, you are. I was like, wow, didn't know you could do that. And my whole life, I'm thinking that church is for church. God wants an hour and a half of your time. Check in with me and you're good. It lasts seven days, but come back next Sunday because you need a refill. And it'll last seven days. And I'm thinking just check in and live how you need to live. But I didn't realize that what I was learning, I was supposed to apply it to my own life. I'm supposed to actually live this thing out. And if I actually live this thing out, I could see results in my life that God talks about in Scripture. And sometimes I wonder why I'm so full of depression or anxiety or fear about the future or worry or lack or in pain. It's because I hear God and I don't do it. I plan every day for destruction. And what God is saying, I got blessing for you, son. I got blessing for you, daughter. If you would just do what I say, I got more than enough for you. Just hear it, believe it, and do it. Hear it, believe it, and do it. Say with me. Hear it, believe it, and do it. We do what? We hear it, we believe it, and we do it. And when we do, we will reap the blessings, and we will reap the harvest, and we will reap the rewards of walking out what God has commanded us to. How many want to walk in the blessing and the rewards of God? Someone say, be about it. Faith is actually incomplete when you don't do anything with it. It says in verse 22, go bring up verse 22 again. The second part of it says, his actions made his faith complete. In other words, until you have works, you have incomplete faith. Your faith is missing an element. Your faith is not mature to its fullest potential. You know what that word complete means? It means this, to bring to the end goal. To bring to the end goal. In other words, your actions, the, the goal of your faith is to become action. The goal of what you believe is to manifest as your behavior. And if your faith never grows and matures and, be, and starts controlling who you are and what you do, then your faith is still incomplete. It has not reached its goal. The same way when I plant a fruit tree, what's the goal of an orange tree when I plant it? What do I want? I want oranges. And until I get those oranges, those orange leaves are not going to taste good. The bark is not going to do it for me. The roots, mm-mm. But until I get that fruit, that spiritual fruit, that actual harvest of bringing it into reality, that tree's incomplete. And what God is saying is your faith is not complete until I see some fruit come out of you, until I see some action come from you, until I see you living out what you're learning, until I see you being patient with the person that's coming against you, until I see you loving the person that's cursing you, until I see you walking out with my, with my self-control and resistant temptation when the devil tries to tempt you. In those moments, God is speaking. Come on, God just put the lights up in here. He said, he said, wake up. This is what God is doing. He, God is trying to teach us something that, wow, man, we just got dark right now. There we go. God is trying to show us something. 
He's trying to show us something. And sometimes we make it a little more complicated than it needs to be. And we don't know why some people are full of faith and, other, and walking in God's goodness and other people aren't. And the formula is simple. Hear it and do it. And you will receive the blessings of God. How many know that that's just an easy formula to walk in? So now, let's look at the next point. Number three. Those who have faith and actions will be declared right in God's sight. Those who have both faith and actions will be declared right in God's sight. James 2.23 says, and so it happened. Just as the scriptures say. I'll pause there really quick. You know that everything God says comes to pass? That's how good you could trust him. God is so good at keeping his word that even him just saying things, things start to create out of nothing. God is so good at keeping his word, he could just say, mm, let there be light. Boom, light exists when it didn't before. He could say, let's form the earth. Boom, speak it, and the earth exists out of nothing. Everything begins to come to fruition. If God is that good at his word, he surely will keep his promise when he says it. So it says, and so it happened just as the scriptures say. It happened just as God said it would. Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Abraham believed. He walked it out. When he shown, he was going to give his son, and God counted him as righteous in that moment. He said, I know for sure you mean what you say you mean. And so he was counted as righteous. And he was even called the friend of God. This is key. I want to be called a friend of God. How many want to be called a friend of God? Well, let me tell you the difference between a friend and a crazy relative. Have you ever met somebody that's related to a celebrity? Or so they say. They're like, yeah, I'm Beyonce's cousin. Mm-hmm. Yo, you didn't know? Yup. My auntie Shirley, her second cousin, third cousin, son's niece, twice removed. Mm-hmm. Yup. That's me. I'm Beyonce's cousin. I'm like, really? Have you ever met Beyonce? No, I mean... She busy. I'm busy. I don't bother her. Everyone try to talk to her, but I'm not that kind of relative. I, that my cousin. Oh, wow. Well, she, she knows you, you're her cousin, right? You guys know about that? Oh, I don't know. I don't bother her. But we're cousins. You didn't know that? We cousins. You ever met anybody like that? They claim they know a celebrity. But you know what? She doesn't know you. That celebrity don't know you. That celebrity didn't even pick you to be their cousin. That celebrity didn't, it's by default and by law. They did not choose you to be their crazy relative. Let's say that this person is right. They didn't pick you. They didn't say, yeah, that's my cousin, and I decided that's my cousin. It didn't happen that way. But a friend is totally different. A friend is somebody I picked. A friend is someone I want to be around. A friend is someone I'm familiar with. A friend is somebody I can trust. A friend is somebody when they go to battle, I'm going to back them up. Uh, come on, you remember back in the day, if your friend got into it, that means you got into it too. I'm going down with my friend. I don't care if we both go down, we're going down together. A friend is somebody you're going to be there with them in the high moments and in the low moments. A friend is somebody you love to be around, you work together with. And what God is saying, you're not just related to me by default, by law. You're not just my crazy kids. You are my friend when you do what I tell you to do. 
To be a friend of God, we must obey what he tells us. I want to be God's friend. I want to be God's partner. I want to be God's co-laborer. I want to be someone that God loves to associate with. I want to be someone that God is proud to be around. I want to be someone that doesn't grieve the Holy Spirit. But me and the Holy Spirit, everywhere we go, we're excited. We roll together in every dark place, in every dark corner. Me and God, we're right side by side, ready to conquer San Bernardino, ready to conquer Pomona ready to conquer Mexico, Kenya, Uganda, LA, me and my God, me and my friend, we're going to go anywhere. And I know my friend's going to back me up. If you mess with me, you're messing with my friend too. Trust me, you got both of us in this. I want to be a friend of God. I want to partner with God. Friends fight with each other. They fight for each other. John 15, 14 says, you are my friend's. If you do what I command. You're my friends if you do what I command. I am a friend of God. We sing it. I am a friend of God. Yeah. Come on, bring it back. I am a friend of God. He called me friend. Come on, one more time. Let's sing it out, everybody. If you know it, bring it back. I am a friend of God. We're singing in church. Hallelujah. I am a friend of God. Yes, that's me. I'm a friend. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Remember that song? We'll be singing that, driving. And God says, now go talk to that person about how much I love them. Hang on, God. I'm busy worshiping you. I am a friend of God. God, I'm busy. I'm praying. I'm in my prayer closet, God. God says, you're still in your prayer closet? I'm over here. I'm in the streets. I'm in the hood. I'm in the homeless camp. I'm trying to love some people. I'm over here in the complexes here in San Bernardino. I'm trying to take care of a needy family. I'm over here in a single mom's home. She's trying to raise four kids by herself. I'm trying to get her some groceries. I'm over here, the person that's locked up in prison. No one has talked to them, loved them, seen them, shared a gospel with them. I'm over here trying to visit someone in the hospital. They're dying of cancer and disease. I'm over here. You're still over there in your prayer closet. That's good. I was there earlier this morning, but now I'm over here. It's time to get to work. It's time to put to action what you believe. It's time to stop talking about it. And it's time to actually be about it. It's time to stand for what you believe and put it into action. Someone say, be about it. See, God is looking for people that are done talking, that are done being someone that in their face they say, I love you, but in the back they're betraying them. Some of us need to get rid of our Judas mentality. Some of us right now got a Judas friendship with God. When in front of everybody, we're good. And at the supper time, God, I love you. And all these things, we're there for all the ministry assignments. But when it comes down to it, when it's time to live for God, we betray him with our lifestyle. And we mock God with the way we live. God is saying, I'm not a God that should be mocked. I do not want people that just talk it and don't live it. God is looking for people that are going to rise up and say, I'm done talking. And I'm going to live this thing out for good. Come on, how many people in here are saying, I'm ready to live this thing out? Last point. Your faith is longing to partner with action. Your faith is longing for it. Verse 24. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. There's this term. I've never heard it before because I made it up. Called lonely faith. Someone say lonely faith. You know what lonely faith is? It's faith that's alone and not paired up with action. I wonder how many of us are struggling from lonely faith. You got faith, but it's all alone. Go back to that scripture. You got faith, but it's alone. I, got, I, got, I, I believe in God. I believe what he says is true. But I don't show it by what I do. My faith is alone. How many of us are dealing with this today? Your faith is lonely. 
and, and, and your, but your faith desires more than anything to manifest into action. This is why we wonder why we have no fulfillment in our walk with God. Why we have no passion anymore. Why we have no fire. And you wonder why you were at one point on fire for God. You wonder why at one point you were so in love with God and you had so much joy in this walk and now you don't know where it's at. I'll tell you where it's at. It's sitting in your actions. It's waiting for you. The word is in you. The faith is in you. The power is in you. The presence of the Holy Spirit is with you. Now let it come out. Let it manifest into your actions. Let it become somebody you are, not just somebody you say you are. Let it become something you do instead of something you just say. Live this thing out and be about it. There are two significant moments in our life, church. There's the moment you believe, and there's the moment you prove it. And what God is saying today, I'm looking for that generation of people who will step up and really live for me in those tough moments. You know, God did not hesitate to prove his love for you. Romans 5, 8 says this. But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us. By the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God is saying, I'm not just going to say it. I'll show you. I'll show you how extreme my love is for you. It says that I love you so much that I'm not even demanding anything in return before I give you everything that I have. God did not withhold his only son from you. He gave us Jesus without us doing anything to deserve it. That's real love. That's true faith. Today, maybe you're struggling with this faith not being partnered with what you do. There was a moment in my life, I can remember when I was in my early years of college, I went to a Christian school and everybody at that school was Christian. <laughs> including me. We used to have chapel services. And it was a requirement. You had to check in and literally had to check in and you would get credit. And I remember one chapel service, they had us write down on a little piece of paper a letter to God. And in that moment, I couldn't write anything except the words, I'm sorry. I still remember what that index card looked like. I wrote it down. I was ashamed of it. I hid it from other people because I didn't want them to know that I talked this big talk. But I wasn't living like it. I said, God, I'm sorry for ignoring you, I'm sorry for neglecting you, and I'm sorry for doing it my way. I'm sorry. And on that card was covered in ink and tears. I went home that day in my car and spent hours in my car crying before God. Just crying out to him and telling him how sorry I was for living the life I was living. I just wanted to come clean. And God is so good. And in that moment, I wasn't met with a hammer, but I was met with a gracious, loving hand of God reaching out to me and saying, I got you. I'll forgive you. I'll set you free. 
church, if anything should come from this moment, it's this. It's not a hammer. This is a wake-up call. If you're ready to say, God, I'm sorry. My faith has been lonely. I'm sorry for neglecting you. I haven't been your friend. I haven't been about it. But I'm ready to give it all to you. Close your eyes in this moment. Forget that anyone else is in the room. And let God tell you in your heart where you stand. If you're saying, I need to come clean and I need to pair up my faith with my actions. Then when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hands. I see all those hands. I see all those hands. Keep them up. Keep them high. Keep them high. I see all those hands all over the room. It's good. I'm proud of you. And I know God is proud of you. You just took action is what you did. I'm giving you another moment because there's another wave of people. And I know it's hard, but you're struggling on the inside. And you're saying, I wanted to raise my hand, but I didn't. Now is your chance. If that's you and you didn't raise your hand, I'm going to count to three again. One, two, three. Take action. I got you. Good job. Good job. Good job. I'm proud of you. Good job. Good job. It's okay. God knew. God knew. We're just coming clean. I want to make another call. Anybody that wants to give their life to Jesus, who wants to surrender everything to him, you're saying, I don't know where I would go if I were to die. I don't know if I'd spend eternity with God in heaven or I don't know if I would go to hell forever. Well, here's how we can know. The Bible says the price for sin is death, which means we owe a big price for the wrong decisions we make. And you know who sinned in this room? Everybody who's a human being. Everybody. But God loves us so much that he sent Jesus as your representative. And Jesus represented you and all your sin. Back in time, 2,000 years ago, he represented you, knowing you would sin today. And he paid for all of it. And he, 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 gave, he had the, the full ransom covered and paid for, for all your debt. For anybody that would believe in him and accept him as Lord and repent of their sin and turn to him, they will be saved. So if at the count of three, you're saying, I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. And I want to have eternal life. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Raise your hands. I see that, that whole row, the whole family. So proud of you guys. I see your hands. I see those hands over here. I see all those hands in the back. This is so awesome. I see the hand. Last row. Proud of you. Proud of you. Can we do this without anybody leaving? We're going to try something. I want us to all stand. And I want us to do this. Anybody that raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to pair up your faith with your action. And in this moment, I want you to make your way out of your seat to the aisle. And I want you to come forward. Take action in this moment. Be about it right now in this time. You said, God, that's me. I want you, if you got family with you, bring them up with you. If you need to bring your persons up, grab it with you. But don't let anything hold you back at your seat right now. In this moment, church is where we clap and we get excited and we cheer them on. If you raise your hand for any one of those two calls, any one of those two calls, I want you to come to the front. I know there were more hands than that. Come on, don't let anything hold you back right now. You're saying, that's me. I need to pair up my faith with action. I need to stop just talking about it and I need to be about it. I need to live this thing out once and for all. Come on, church. Let's give them a hand right now. In the Come on, let's give them a hand. In the name of Jesus, every soul that is ready to be saved today will come to know him. Come on. Come on, this is exciting, church. This is where we get pumped. This is a good day. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming, church. They're still coming. We're still clapping. We're still excited. Yes. 
Thank you, Lord. Yes. God is good. He's here in this place right now. If you're saying I should be up there, it's time to come up. Come on up. Amen. We need some more leaders. If you're a leader in here, DG leader, altar worker, uh, prayer pastor, uh, whatever. We need you. <laughs> we need your help up here. Altar workers, DG leaders, come on up. Thank you so much. Everyone that came up, I want you to look at me for a quick second. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, man. I'm proud of you. Today's a new day in your life. I'm so proud of you. It's a new beginning for you. Proud of you, man. This is what we're going to do. We're going to coach you and help you and train you. Earlier in service, you saw all those people standing up here. They graduated that class, Holy Warriors. That class is going to change your life completely. Your next step, take the class. Your next step, take the class. Be about it. Live it out. Proud of you. I love you. I'm proud of you. This is a moment we'll never forget. And when we take this class, your life will never be the same. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you. And they're going to help you. They're going to get you signed up for the class. Altar workers, we're going to open our app and click the I Got Saved banner. Okay, it's right in the front. That's what we're going to do. We need a few more ladies up here. If we got any ladies up here, that'd be awesome. Let's do this right here. Awesome. Okay, great, great. All right, let's do this. I want everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus. You're speaking to Jesus right now. Say, Jesus. Thank you for going to the cross on my behalf. You didn't deserve it. You never sinned. I was a sinner. But you paid for it like you were the sinner. You died on the cross and you rose from the dead so that I can be saved and forgiven. So today, I put my faith in you, but not just by my words, but with my actions. I will live the life you've called me to live. There's no holding back. I surrender it all. I let it go. Thank you, God, for saving me, for setting me free, for giving me a new start. From this moment forward, I'll never be the same. My life belongs to you. I am yours. I am your friend. Use me, God. Send me, God. Deliver me, Lord. Set me free from all bondage, from lies, from deceit. I give it all. I give it all to you, Lord. And I put my faith in you. Fill me with your spirit. Make me new creation. I am yours. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say, amen. Give you God a shout of praise today. Come on, if you, if you know you serve a good God, give him one more shout of praise. He's a good God. We love you, church. God bless you. We'll be here Wednesday night at 7. And don't forget, next Sunday is an awesome message from Pastor Mark, a worldwide message. If you want to join the Freeway Outreach, we'll be back here tonight at 5 o'clock in the South Hall. And if you're a young adult in the room, be here, young adults, Friday night. Friday night at 7 p.m. for the close of Mission Month. It's going to be crazy. We love you. If you need prayer, come on up. We'd love to pray with you.